In the previous two lectures, we looked at the macro foundations of China's Gilded Age, beginning with market opening under Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s. First, we talked about the political foundation he laid, an autocracy with democratic characteristics. Then we looked at changes in central local state relations in the form of directed improvisation, directions from the top, plus improvisation from below. Now we're going to turn to a third set of questions. What does improvisation look like on the ground? Development is more than a problem of going from poor to rich. To grow their economies, poor countries need to have good governance and modern institutions, the kind found in rich countries such as protection of private property rights, rule of law, competent, uncorrupt technocracies. But to establish good governance, poor countries also need to have a certain level of development. So which comes first, growth or good governance? This chicken and egg problem is what we call a poverty trap. How can poor countries spark and sustain growth when they lack the institutional prerequisites for prosperity. On this question, much ink has been spilled, producing three schools of thought, but none point away out of the poverty trap because their thinking is linear or deterministic. One school of thought says growth comes first, began by injecting lots of aid and massive capital into an economy and then once the economy takes off, all good things will follow. The best example of this argument is Jeffrey Sachs, The End of Poverty, where he called on the first world to donate billions of dollars to the third world. This, he promised, will lift the poor out of poverty. But in the end, Sachs' experiment failed supremely. Despite receiving generous funding and complete leeway to remake 12 modern African villages in his vision, it failed for the same reason that communist regimes failed. His development plans relied on central planning. Technocrats in New York City could not anticipate all the contingencies that arose on the ground. Their plans did not fit local conditions. The second school of thought argues if it's too hard to kickstart growth, let's start by getting institutions right. If societies can establish good governance, their economies will prosper. The World Bank defines good governance, or institutions, as open and enlightened policymaking, a professional bureaucracy, accountable government, and a strong civil society all behaving under the rule of law. But how do countries obtain good, strong institutions in the first place? How can poor and weak societies establish good governance if doing so is as hard as stimulating growth? The famous economists Asimoglu and Robinson claim to have an answer to this conundrum in their book, Why Nations Fail. The roots of good governance lie in history. According to them, some former colonies became rich, while others are poor because they had different colonial legacies. The ones in North America inherited democratic institutions with strong protection of private property and inclusiveness. Therefore, these countries became rich. On the other hand, colonies in Africa and Latin America inherited exploitative institutions so they remain unequal and corrupt and therefore poor. That is why they conclude, once society gets organized in a certain way, this tends to persist. This persistence and the forces that created it also explain why it is so difficult to remove world inequality and to make poor countries prosperous. But if they're right, then it means that Poor and weak nations are stuck. There's no need to study or practice development since we cannot change the past. This is exactly what Stefan de Kahn, former chief economist of DFIT, said 
in his comments on why nations fail. Their advice may be summarized as, get yourself a good history rather than the bad one you've suffered. So on the chicken and egg question, we're stuck. That's because I argue the question is wrong. The right question we should ask is, how do entrepreneurial activities emerge under adversity despite the absence of ideal conditions? On this question, classical political economy has virtually no answer. It knows plenty about why poor nations fail, but it doesn't know why some poor nations didn't fail. And this is where the Chinese experience is so crucial and valuable. The short answer to my question is deceptively simple. Use what you have. Use what you have means innovative grassroots actors repurposing existing structures and widely available cheap or free resources to kickstart new entrepreneurial activities, even entire industries, often in ways that defy first world conventional wisdom. China is full of examples. Let me name just three of them. In the 1980s, local governments invented partial property rights as a substitute for private property rights by turning pre-existing townships and villages into ownership units. In the 1990s to 2000s, local governments repurposed communist bureaucracies that are not professional and not specialized in the Western sense to recruit investors en masse, essentially turning them into a capitalist machine. Then from the 2000s and present, private entrepreneurs in China took advantage of structural gaps, namely the absence of consumer credit cards, and applied existing technology, smartphone apps, to create a revolutionary business model, fintech. For an example of using what you have, focusing on property rights, I'll tell a story from one of the cases featured in How China Escaped the Poverty Trap. Forest Hill, a city located in Fujian province. Like other parts of China, Forest Hill City did not have private property rights when it began its development process. In the 1980s, the priorities of the city leadership were clear. Feed the population and jumpstart manufacturing. However, there were two constraints. First, private ownership was taboo and not endorsed by the central party. Second, the implementation of market reform required the political support and even enthusiasm of local communist cadres. What kind of property rights would fit within these constraints? That is not private, incentivizes production, and enlists communist cadres in the process of industrialization. Private individuals ran small factories in the name of pre-existing township and village governments, which were in an intermediate zone neither private nor part of the central state. These were known as township and village enterprises, TVEs. TVEs operated on the basis of partial property rights. Property rights are actually a bundle of rights, comprising rights over control, management, and transfer. TVEs were aligned with socialist principles in that the right of transfer or ownership was collectively held by townships and villages. At the same time, however, private individuals could exercise managerial control over operations and made profit. Such a practice was known as wearing a red hat. These enterprises became the major driving force of rural industrialization. The 1980s saw a mini growth spurt. The initial success of TVEs, however, soon hit bottlenecks. Because they were still considered part of the planned economy, TVEs were burdened by state-imposed restrictions 
such as mandatory production targets. Yet local officials had no authority to attempt outright privatization during the first decade of reform. Crossing the red line of privatization risks persecution. This is an example of how direction matters critically in directed improvisation, as we discussed in the last episode. An ideological decision of this magnitude had to come from the highest ranks of the party. This momentous shift came in 1993, when the post-Deng leadership, led by Jiang Zemin, announced the groundbreaking decision to establish a socialist market economy. That is, to pursue full-fledged market reforms and ideologically permit the private sector. A local official of the city remarked, when the central government makes a firm decision, this decision will trigger seismic changes across the country. Seizing the window of opportunity, the leaders of Forest Hill proceeded to privatize TVEs using a euphemism, restructuring. Within a few years after 1993, scores of TVEs were restructured. Through this process of ownership transfer, the individuals who managed the TVEs became the city's first batch of private entrepreneurs, indirectly enabled by state support and capital. Yet during the 1990s, the local business environment was far from predictable, much less friendly. Officials demanded petty bribes from businesses in exchange for approving licenses. Social scientists refer to such petty corruption as speed money, paying to overcome hurdles and red tape. How did private businesses cope? In the place of partial property rights, informal property rights arose, achieved by cultivating close personal relationships with individual officials who could help investors mediate disputes, navigate regulations, and obtain necessary approvals. Investment courtship during the 1990s was highly personalized, with each official acting like the equivalent of a corporate account manager. As the private sector grew from strength to strength, entrepreneurs began to have more voice. Party bosses invited entrepreneurial stars to join formal political institutions, including the city's People's Congress, equivalent to a legislature, and the Consultative Conference, a policy discussion forum, where business leaders could make their complaints heard and demand better protections and services from the government. Eager to attract and keep businesses, local governments rolled out a series of reforms to cut predatory practices, raise public sector pay, and hire qualified personnel. These local developments coincided with political shifts at the central level, where the central party progressively affirmed the political status of private ownership. Locals characterized the decade of the 2000s as a big growth spurt compared to a mini growth spurt of the 1980s. Underlying the impressive trajectory of the 2000s were several conditions laid down during the 1990s that provided a more predictable, rules-based environment for doing business. These conditions included formal commitments to property rights protection, a raft of administrative reforms, salary raises financed by a growing tax base, and an increasingly large and assertive capitalist class. Low-level bureaucratic predation declined. But this doesn't mean that corruption disappeared. Rather, it changed in quality from speed money to access money. Access money refers to collusive corruption between elites, where businesses pay not to overcome red tape, but rather to buy lucrative privileges like cheap land and procurement contracts. 
In my second book, China's Gilded Age, I show that access money became the dominant kind of corruption in China. It was also the type of corruption that Xi Jinping vowed to fight when he came to office in 2012. In sum, contrary to conventional wisdom in political economy, Forest Hill did not begin its development process with secure private property rights and a non-corrupt government. Instead, it began with partial property rights, adapted from pre-existing institutions, which evolved into informal property rights through personal relationships between officials and investors. And by the 2000s, more formal protection of private property and a less predatory government emerged. That is to say, development is not a linear process that begins with either economic growth or good governance. Stripping away the details in all of the cases I studied, one key pattern emerges. Development is best understood as a three-step co-evolutionary process. Use what you have to build new markets. Market growth alters preferences and resources. And finally, modern institutions sustain markets. Importantly, my conceptualization of development distinguishes between early and late stages of development. Building markets is not the same as sustaining markets, just as running a startup is not the same as managing a Fortune 500 company. Dominant theories in political economy are theories about good modern institutions, such as private property rights protection, that are necessary to preserve markets that have already been built. But when markets barely or do not yet exist, which is the situation facing poor countries, building markets from the ground up demands drastically different institutions, strategies, and methods. Methods that appear wrong at an advanced stage of development can fit the needs of early development well. Vice versa is also true. A different way of expressing using what you have is harnessing normatively weak institutions to build new markets. I stress normatively in the sense that judged by ideal first world benchmarks, the methods used by grassroots actors in China appear weak, wrong, backward, deviant. They are therefore overlooked or dismissed. I know what you might be thinking right now. All of that just applies to China, right? No. In fact, in cases as diverse as late medieval Europe, 19th century America, and the rise of Nollywood in contemporary Nigeria, I discovered a similar pattern. Development unfolds in a three-step co-evolutionary process. The first step is harnessing normatively weak institutions to build markets. Conventional strong institutions only emerge at the end of the process. First, consider the evolution of contract enforcement in late medieval Europe. Throughout the 12th and 13th centuries, merchants across far-flung corners of Europe traded with one another despite the lack of strong centralized states. These merchants were able to overcome transaction problems through an institutional innovation known as the Community Responsibility System or CRS. In this system, each merchant belonged to a self-governed commune, a social unit that fell into a gray area between states and communities. Notice how this echoes the role of TVEs in China's context. If a merchant from commune A cheats on a partner from commune B, then Commune B had the right to punish all of the members of Commune A. In this way, all the communes had incentives to enforce contracts among their members, acting as a single collective unit. 
But as trade boomed and communes grew in size, the cost of verifying communal membership increased. Dishonest merchants could escape from one commune to another. Wealthier merchants also saw few benefits in participating in communes. Thus, by the end of the 13th century, the CRS gradually disintegrated and was replaced by courts, where individuals rather than communes were responsible for commercial transactions. Next, public finance in America. Did America, upon its founding, begin with a complete package of good institutions, including uniform taxation, fiscal responsibility, and a non-corrupt government? No. Instead of raising taxes, America in the early 19th century practiced taxless financing to raise funds for building infrastructure. State governments issued charters, essentially monopoly or exclusive rights to run businesses, among which banking was especially profitable. The issuing of charters became a breeding ground for corruption between government and capitalists. Taxless finance helped U.S. state governments quickly raise funds for infrastructure, but it was non-transparent and risky. When an economic downturn struck in 1837, marking the start of America's first Great Depression, local governments were unable to pay their debt, sparking a downward spiral of stalled construction, falling land prices, and more defaults. This American history bears strong resemblance to China today, where local governments borrowed too much to build infrastructure and are now facing serious financial troubles in an economic downturn. The Panic of 1837 forced U.S. legislators to change their constitutions to limit taxless finance. This included a general incorporation law that allowed free entry to all lines of businesses, restrictions on the amount and procedures of public borrowing, and uniform property tax codes. Last but not least, the rise of Nollywood in Nigeria. Nigeria often brings to mind poverty, state failure, endemic corruption. But few notice that Nigeria has produced the second largest film industry in the world by production volume. Nollywood is the second largest source of jobs after agriculture and the second largest export sector after oil. Nollywood succeeded despite seemingly impossible odds. In the 1980s, the Nigerian economy was in shambles. Rampant violence forced people to stay home, eliminating audiences at home theaters. In an environment where basic law and order was lacking, the protection of intellectual property rights was of least concern to the government and to people. How could a film industry emerge and thrive within two decades under such ominous conditions? In order to distribute their films, filmmakers relied on marketeers, including traders and thugs who can navigate dangerous environments in a way that ordinary people cannot. They both distributed and pirated the films, eating into the profit margins of filmmakers. As a result, their profits were low, but filmmakers were still willing to do it because it was better than nothing. They also adapted by making films quickly and sometimes within a week, but with very low budgets and quality. Even then, there was an advantage to this setup. The marketeers helped the industry build market recognition throughout Nigeria and then Africa within a short time there was suddenly a demand for Nollywood films that did not previously exist. But this initial system was not permanent. Over time, as the industry grew, audiences began demanding higher quality films. And filmmakers also demanded formal protection of intellectual property for their work. The government also began to pay attention 
when they realized that Nollywood was making its name on the global stage. Today, Nollywood as an industry is evolving towards professionalization and demand for stronger enforcement of intellectual property stepped up among regulators and top tier producers. Despite their extremely divergent context, all three cases share a similar pattern, development as a three-step co-evolutionary process that begins with using what you have or harnessing normatively weak institutions in creative ways to build new markets. China's experience is part of a hidden global history, hidden only because we've been blinded by the normative assumption that good market-supporting institutions have to look like the forms found in advanced economies today.